Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dawn Bauman. I'm CAI Senior Vice President of Government and Public Affairs. Welcome and thank you for joining Community Associations Institute today for this important webinar on uh, business partners of CAI and how to handle issues related to coronavirus. I would like to thank our presenters today. We have Lincoln Hobbs, who is a fellow of the College of Community Association Lawyers, a, an attorney in Utah, John Hammersmith, who's CEO of a management company, Hammersmith Management in Denver, Colorado, in the greater Denver area in Colorado, um, and Vishnu Sharma, who is a CPA in Florida. Also a member, Lincoln and Vishnu are members of CAI's Board of Trustees. John Hammersmith is the past president of the CAI Board of Trustees. The information we're providing today is intended to um, be helpful to small businesses um, dealing with community associations and COVID-19. The information we're providing is not intended to be legal advice. While Lincoln Hobbs is an attorney, he doesn't understand the circumstances um, or any of the contracts that you're working with, but he will be sharing information with all of you, we'll all be sharing information with you, but please, please don't take this as, as legal advice because we don't know all of the circumstances around your situations. So information is just intended to be helpful and resourceful um, as we all try to navigate these really challenging times. So I will, um, now, start with some of the questions that we've already um, heard from many of you on. Um, and the first question that we're going to talk about is related to the federal stimulus package funding for small businesses. And these are for profit businesses. We're assuming all of our um, business partner members of CAI are um, for profit. Many of them small businesses, and when I say small business, that's um, member or businesses with fewer than 500 employees. Um, if you want information about community association issues related to the stimulus package, the federal stimulus package, that's on our webpage. We're really going to focus our um, conversation today on small businesses and CAI business partners. Just giving a very quick overview, um, I'll start, and then I will also um, turn it over to my experts on the panel. The probably the most beneficial piece of the stimulus package for small businesses is the Paycheck Protection Program, otherwise known as the PPP. It's facilitated um, through the Small Business Administration. Um, these are loans that may turn into grants, or at least a portion of them may turn into grants. Um, eligible costs or expenses that um, can be paid for through these loans from your business. Uh, your business expense includes salary, um, wages and commissions, vacation, severance pay, group health insurance, retirement benefits, state and local employee compensation taxes. Um, it is recommended that you work with your bank, um, a bank that you already have an established relationship with to file the application for this particular loan slash grant. Um, the, again, the we have information on our webpage with additional um, guidance on the Paycheck Protection Program. That information on our website is um, on caionline.org backslash SBA underscore PPP. So that's caionline.org backslash S as in Sam, B as in boy, A underscore PPP. I'd like to turn it over to Vishnu Sharma, who again is a CPA in Florida, who has some additional insight and expertise on the Paycheck Protection Program and other federal stimulus programs to share with the group. Vishnu? Thanks, Don. Uh, happy to be a part of this today. Um, sharing what we know and what we've learned. Uh, this particular program, the PPP program, is an ever-evolving. It literally changes daily, if not multiple times daily, um, up into including last week, Thursday. This program was supposed to go live on Friday and did go live on Friday, but at 6 p.m., uh, any banker will tell you that they received a 35-page memorandum from SBA and Treasury, um, giving them still changes to implement that's why when February, when Friday came, 
Um, Bank of America, for example, was one of the only banks that was actually up and running. Other banks came online. Chase Bank, for example, came online at one o'clock and they came online with a seven uh, question questionnaire that somebody would get back to you. And then within 48 to 72 hours, other banks um, came online at different points over the next two, three and four days. Um, the process is important to understand because the way the legislation was written was they wanted to get this expedited as quickly as possible. So they ran it through an existing SBA program, uh, the SBA loan program 7A. And the only way you can apply for a loan through the SBA 7A loan program is through a participating bank. So it has to be a bank that is already participating in this program. They were opening up the opportunity to participate uh, to other banks, but because this came together so fast, um, there wasn't an opportunity really for other banks to get involved. Uh, there are limitations being put on it because the volume has been crushing for the banks. The banks have put limitations on it in addition to what's already with the SBA program. So if you didn't have an existing relationship with your bank uh, or with a bank that is participating in the program prior to February 15th, 2020, uh, more than likely they will not accept a new application from you if you're a new client going to that bank. So you want to go to the bank that you already have an existing relationship with and try to uh, work with them to find out if they're A, participating in the program and then what you need to do and do it as quickly as possible. Uh, the concern last week that carries through into this week is that uh, the money, $350 billion, sounds like a tremendous amount, but it is expected actually to run out fairly quickly. And the program was put in place in two different ways in which small businesses are able to apply this week, uh, this past Friday, and contractors and sole proprietors are allowed to apply this coming weekend. Um, and there was a concern that there may not even be any money left to give out this weekend. Um, there is... Can, there's talk about an additional $250 billion in funding uh, that was actually supposed to be done today uh, by the Senate, but that looks like it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So that'll be part of whatever the fourth tranche is on this legislation. So, um, Thank yeah. you so Go much, ahead. Vishnu. Those are, that's really helpful information. I will say um, from CAI's advocacy perspective, we have been in touch with um, congressional leadership and I believe there will be additional funding while not today. Um, I do think it will be happening sometime in the next week or so. Within the next week or so, there will be additional funding specifically for the PPP program. I'm going to pass it to, um, to John for any additional information you have about small businesses and the PPP program. Great, thanks Don and welcome everybody. Hope everybody's doing well and safe. Um, first, I would just want to really underscore the importance of one of the things that Vishnu said, and that is having a relationship with the bank. I think it's um, this is a really, really good example of how critical it is to have a strong uh, relationship with the bank, not just with this, but with other things that come along as well. Um, I started the process about two and a half weeks ago. Uh, it went through a number of variations, as Vishnu was talking about. Uh, finally got the loan submitted, application submitted on Friday afternoon. Uh, there was, I believe, also another revision that happened um, Friday morning, so 6 o'clock Thursday night, then Friday morning. So it's an ever-changing program. Um, we still don't know exactly um, what's going to happen with all of it, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that we did get funded last night, so I actually already have money in our bank account. Uh, but jumping on these things quickly is, is of utmost importance. Thank you. Lincoln, do you have anything to add? Uh, nothing substantive. I did go through the PPP application process twice, did it Friday, got a notification Saturday that the application process had changed, applied again on Saturday, both or excuse me, on Monday, both times were relatively simple, straightforward. I have not yet received any money. All right. All right. Um, we are going to have our first question. Um, and Vishnu, I'm going to let you read the question and provide answer to the question as we move forward. Gentlemen, please read your question, provide an answer, see if anyone else on the panel has any additions, and then we'll move forward to the next one. Does that sound good? Yep, great. All right, Vishnu, I'll turn it over to you. Vishnu, is your microphone open? Yes, how about that? 
All right, perfect. How should a business partner keep track of SBA loans spending? So John and I were actually talking about this before the call. Um, very important question. And the I, I think the most important thing is to speak to your bank and get advice from your bank as to what they're hearing. Because remember, this program runs through your bank and your bank is going to be the person who is going to be validating uh, the funds if you are going to ask for forgiveness of this amount and essentially convert this into a grant after the eight week period or whatever that period turns out to be. So whether you keep it in a segregated account or you um, mix it in with your existing operating, you really need to make sure you're speaking with the bank and understanding. You wanna make sure you're keeping detailed records of all expenses. Uh, the most important part of this program is that you can use the funds that you get 75% of it can be used for payroll and payroll related expenses such as payroll and retirement medical uh, insurance. 25% of it can be used for the other allowed expenses which would be mortgage interest, uh, rent, etc. So um, that's it for me. I want to pass, give John an opportunity to speak on that. Yeah, as Vishen said, I think it's really just um, making sure that you keep uh, excellent track of, of what you spend the money on. There's a lot of questions that are still out there. And just to reiterate, it's really important to go to your bank to get those answers because they're the ones that um, are going to make determinations in the end. Thank you. I'm sorry to pipe in. I said I wasn't going to, but um, Vishnu, I wanted to ask, could you provide some information about how that loan may turn into a grant, what the requirements are? Sure. Um, after eight weeks, uh, you have the opportunity, and, and there again, cannot stress as many times I say this on this call, to work with your banker, whoever your banker is. Um, they will give you paperwork, and please note in the paperwork you get from your bank, it says they're not responsible for letting you know when your eight weeks is up or when the time is up to convert this. So you've got to be keeping track to make sure that you know. And the tolling time, it's eight weeks from the time you get the loan. So once you get that loan in place, just put a tickler in there that six weeks in, you're reaching out to your bank and understanding their timeline at that particular institution you're working with. And at eight weeks, you should be keeping a schedule um, of the expenses that you spend specifically related to the charges you're allowed to go ahead and get reimbursed on. And that would be your payroll, your medical insurance, your 401k contributions, your rent, your mortgage interest related to the business, and your um, whatever the other additional expenses that escape me right now. But whatever those expenses are that are allowed, you keep a schedule of those expenses so that you know um, you were given two and a half times. Everybody has the opportunity to get two and a half times of their payroll costs. And there was a schedule that you have to submit with the loan application. So anything on that that you're submitting is really what you're looking for to be able to get reimbursed by. Keep a schedule, keep good records, and then submit it to the bank. Excellent. Thank you so much. And before we move on from this topic, um, I just want to encourage people if they're working with a bank that says they can, they are out of applications, they can no longer submit applications because they're hearing that they've, they're out of money already. Um, contact your local um, small business administration office. They can be very helpful in helping you find resources in a bank that or a community bank that may be able to help you um if your current bank the one you have a relationship with can't help you in addition i would not hesitate if i were you to reach out to your member of congress to let them know exactly what your situation is and encouraging them to um, make some changes to the cares act okay i'll let you guys move on to the next question thank you i think john this is you it is yes Question is, are you encouraging clubhouse pool repairs now to happen right now while residents are not allowed on the premises? I think one of the things that's really important for all of us is to remember that when things like this happen, we have to just get creative. Um, it's a perfect opportunity to be able to do some work inside in areas that would usually or typically be an inconvenience for owners and residents because uh, people are using the clubhouse or facilities. So um, right now, while every, everyone should be locked down, hopefully is, um, be a great time to be able to go out to the properties and um, hit some of the common areas that are typically used um, without inconveniencing any of the residents. So Vishnu or Lincoln, do you have anything to add? I don't have anything to add on that. 
I'll tell you if, uh, from South Florida's perspective, what we're seeing down here is pretty much every association has shut down all their um, their public facilities. I think between not only the uh, state orders that have come down uh, from the governor, uh, the county, and then the city, it's kind of a rolling um, set or series of mandates as to one upping the other. So the governor seems to lay out the base case of what you have to do. And then the cities and the counties seem to up the game. So for example, we now have uh, where you're required to wear masks um, in certain areas now in certain cities. So Miami Beach, for example, you now have to wear a mask at all times if you're out in public. So we have about six cities in South Florida that now require a mask as mandatory, but it's not a state and it's not a countywide. Um, so we have certain cities where they have told the associations they have to shut down the pool. We actually have a couple of associations that still have their pools open. They just spaced out the chairs and things like that differently, but mostly everybody shut down their common areas. Anything else on that? I'll move on to the next question. Um, how are you planning to handle associations not being able to pay vendors? Um, if you're watching the news, you're aware that 20 million people have applied for unemployment in the last uh, three weeks, meaning that there are a lot of people out there who are going to have some very significant financial hardships, probably more so than we saw in 2008, at least more immediate. So. Obviously, we're we're anticipating um, that there are going to be a lot of problems with people being able to pay their assessments and associations who don't have adequate money set aside, and most, that would be most associations, um, are going to find themselves in some financial difficulties in their ability to pay their vendors. So there are a couple of issues here. One is uh, whether or not the vendors can and will um, back off of, of the need for immediate payment. Um, I think one of the things that I'm hoping that we'll see in this unique circumstance is people and businesses trying to work with, with one another. Uh, presumably, if you were in a uh, situation where you've got vendors that you've had a long-standing relationship with, they may trust that you will pay them. And it may be that if you have a conversation with them now and you say, can we defer payment? Can we make a payment plan for uh, landscaping or whatever? Uh, that that may be a, a possibility. Another possibility, um, going back to the same hope that people are willing to step forward, there's nothing that precludes unit owners who can afford to pay their assessments to pay their assessments in advance. And if an association could ask some of its owners who may have the financial means to be able to pay their assessments in advance, to do so, so so as to avoid the necessity of emergency funding or special assessments, that sort of thing, that would be another option. So I think you've got to have conversations, um, open conversations with your vendors about um, your um, ability to pay, your need for services, um, and to make arrangements whenever possible to uh, defer the payment of, of certain assessments. It's better to have the discussion before you incur the bill than after you incur the bill and have somebody who doesn't have the trust that you will in fact pay them. Thoughts I on that? Everything you said. Um, this is Vishnu. Um, what we're seeing is there's, we have associations that have already mandated and advised us that um, they will send out a reminder notice, but they have put a moratorium on late fees for uh, the next three months. So for April, May, and June, they're not charging late fees. Um, they're simply gonna send out a reminder letter each month. Um, we have uh, some associations that are continuing to charge the late fees and they're going to handle it on a case by case. We haven't seen an overwhelmingly, uh, an overwhelming move one direction or the other, but we are seeing um, kind of a mix of how they're choosing to handle it. Some are being very understanding and very forgiving uh, while others are, um, giving them the opportunity to go ahead and uh, handle it one by one as needed. All right, the next one is actually a, a two-part question. The first part is, how are you protecting your own employees when they need to access the association property? I think it's really important that all of us, um, business partners, managers, everyone, um, have a plan in place for those people that are getting out in public um, with what you're doing to fight uh, COVID-19 and protect yourself and those that uh, you might come in contact with, hopefully six feet apart or more. Um, so I think it's important, number one, that you have a plan in place. And then number two, how do you get that communicated out 
um, to the residents um, at the communities and to the manager and to the boards. Um, and I think the best way to, to make that communication happen is to contact the manager or the management company. Um, almost all of us, if not all of us, have um, means to be able to, to email blasts or text blasts or other ways to uh, communicate with all the residents. And give the manager the opportunity to know when you're going to be on our property so that the manager can send that information out to the homeowners um, so that they know um, not only that you're going to be there, but also what protection and what steps you're taking to protect yourselves and them while you're there. Uh, I th think those are probably the most important things. Additionally, Lincoln? Um, in my business, we don't, we don't, we typically do have face-to-face uh, -face contact with our clients, but in, it's been very easy uh, for us to shift our, our business model and um, have communications with board meetings uh, via Zoom, via any, any number of uh, platforms, social media platforms that allow for those communications. So that's one solution that we've used a lot. I have not seen a courtroom nor a client for over a month, but I've been pr doing pretty much the same sort of thing. I've had a couple of board meetings, or I've had several board meetings in the last week via, via teleconference. Um, I'm actually finding it very uh, efficient and um, probably will see more of it in the future. One other aspect with respect to the uh, interactions that, that uh, service providers may have. Um, I don't know. I think there are a lot of services that can be provided without a face-to-face -face contract. If you have somebody who needs to come make a repair on a project and you can adequately describe by telephone or otherwise in advance and make arrangements so they can access the property, you don't need to have the interaction, the face-to-face -face interaction that you would otherwise have with that, uh, that contractor. You may want to talk to the contractor and explain things, but figure out if you can do so without needing to have the face-to-face six feet or more uh, contact and avoid it entirely if you can. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great idea. One of the things for all the business partners is that if you make sure that you do have access to be able to participate in video meetings um, through Zoom or whatever else the, the companies are using, uh, make sure that the managers and the boards know that, that they know that um, you're available to, to meet with them. It's a great way to stay in touch and in contact um, and also get a pretty good feel for what's going on within the community. So I think that's a great idea. Vishnu, anything on that? Yeah, just the um, the only thing that we see is uh, from our side is the, um, depending on the association, it's a very personal choice when it comes to the trades and or the contractors. Um, general contractors or, or associations, we have a number of associations that have special assessments where they're doing some major renovation work to the buildings. And we have associations that are allowing it to continue. They're taking certain precautions with the trades coming in and out of the building, et cetera. Uh, and we have others that have just shut it all down because they do not want any additional uh, people in the building. Um, outside the building is one thing, but inside the building, they don't want anybody in the building. So just know your building, know your manager, know your board and do the best you can to work around what their concerns and limitations are um, so that your people are protected. But not only that, you're also giving that comfort level to the association um, that your staff is not bringing anything into the building, which is the you know preeminent concern of most of the buildings. One, uh, one thing that John mentioned um, in our pre-conference conference that I thought was notable and, and worth reminding is don't defer life safety issues. Push back if somebody wants to defer some kind of maintenance that is a life safety issue. Let's not create more risk by virtue of worrying about this risk. If something needs to be done and a client is resisting getting it done, I think you need to push back and say, you know, are you creating more liability or more potential for injury or per property damage by not doing it? So. You may need to step forward with some of your clients who um, have a strong uh, disinclination to let anyone on their property. Is it necessary? And if so, make arrangements to get it done. Six. Um, I'll go ahead and, and take six. I'm going to read the question and then I'll start and then I'll defer to John and 
and Lincoln. Um, how are you protecting your employees when they need access to association property? So uh, I'm in a little bit of a unique situation, but the one thing I would tell every business partner is you've got to be flexible and you have to be willing to work with uh, the changes that are continuously coming down because the way I operated six weeks ago versus three weeks ago up until last week is completely different than the way I'm operating this week. And I just implement the changes that's going to change what the way I, implement, uh, I operate going forward. So, you know, at first we went to a reduced shift. I have 21 people on staff. And while I'm the only one who really goes out to the associations, we have a lot of interaction with courier packets and things like that that come directly, documents that come every single day from each of the 60 or so associations we deal with. So there's a continuous concern about the documentation that are coming in and the exposure that the staff has to that. So we have we went to a reduced workday, then we went to a staggered shift where we reduced uh, so that we have no more than 10 people on staff on any given day. Uh, those who could go home and work from home are doing so. The reality is a lot of what we do, like any number of business partners, um, you need to be there, you need to interact so you don't have that luxury of working from home. And for those, you just have to continuously modify. Listen to your staff, um, listen to their concerns um, because that is the number one issue out there in retaining your people because there's some good people and you would hate to lose them over this because the panic and the fear is real and you have to give them the ear and if you let them vent and you let them express that concern and you're able to react to it in whatever way you can, whether it's giving them masks and everybody doesn't wear them, but whoever chooses to wear them, wear them. Uh, everybody doesn't wear gloves, but if they can, if whoever chooses to wear it, wears it. Um, you know, be flexible in what you're doing and be prepared that every week you could be changing the approach that you have to your business. John? Yeah. Um, I address this one a little bit earlier. I think it's just important that everyone have a particular plan in place so that you can communicate that plan to the manager, to the board, and so that the manager can communi communicate that on to, uh, to the homeowners. I think it's also critical in your own businesses to make sure that you stay in touch, hands-on, uh, without putting your hands on employees. So just like we're having this webinar, um, do webinars with your employees. They can still see you. They can see um, what your attitude is. They can see how you're handling it. Uh, you can reassure them about where your business is and where things are headed, uh, what work you're still doing, what work you're not doing. I think that kind of communication is, is critical. We don't, uh, in my business, we don't have much interaction with clients. Well, we don't need to generally have much interaction with clients on property other than the meetings, which we've discussed, which we're doing uh, via telecommunication. But what we have done in the office is we've determined it's easiest to have the staff working at home nine to five because uh, it's that way I can be in the office. They can be in the, they can be working remotely. They can do virtually everything they've done or they need to do remotely. There are some things though that need to be done by office staff like opening mail, processing mail. So we've, we've gone to the staggered shift. Um, my main assistant comes in most days at five o'clock I have a lot of documents that need notarization. She recognizes my signature. I tell her I'm leaving three documents. She's not doing the usual seeing, you know, me notarization, probably not technically proper, but most states have bent their rules a bit. So those things can be processed. She can process credit cards at the end of the day. She can process all of that stuff that needs to be done by a staggered shift. So I haven't seen her for three weeks. She's been working remotely and it, it works very well. She comes in after we leave. She checks to make sure I'm not sticking around longer than I should. And uh, we haven't had any interaction, any personal interaction. We also have um, probably a little bit of obsessiveness. Um, we clean doorknobs and light switches when we leave, and uh, she cleans light switches and doorknobs when she leaves. So they got cleaned twice. Seven, John? Um, I think we already. Touched on that one. The best, way that. With the best way to communicate with Chris. Okay. Yeah, it's through the management company. Yeah, I, I, I you did touch on that this morning. I, one of the things you said this morning that I don't think you said today was rather than having uh, communication come from several sources, have it come from one source. But with that, let's move on. Um, how do I handle community clients who do not need me to fulfill the services of the contract? 
this is sort of the flip side of what I touched on earlier. You've got the uh, vendors that you can't pay for. Um, what about the uh, the vendors who we don't need? To pay for? About our about our people. Um, um, what are we going to? Um, to how are we going to handle? We going to handle that? that? Um, um, first of all, you can probably enforce the contract. Um, if you have a, if, if, if you are a vendor, if you're a, a swimming pool provider and you have a contract that says you're going to provide swimming pool services from a practical standpoint, it's going to depend contract by contract. But as the contractor, you could probably enforce the contract and say, you're going to pay me, uh, regardless of whether or not I'm paying the services or providing the services. Now, this is another, like I said, the flip side of that. Do you want to do that? Um, sure, you might be able to do it. You might be able to enforce a contract that you're not providing any services on, but you're probably not going to get that contract next year. So try to be uh, have the discussions with uh, your uh, business partners. Uh, maybe they don't need pool services, but maybe they do need, maybe they don't need to have their, uh, their chemicals processed, but maybe they could make some repairs to the pool that your company could provide. Find other ways that both parties can benefit from the unique circumstances we have where the service provider can still provide services. Maybe you alter the services that are provided a little bit, shift something that would otherwise be provided off season to, to the fact that the pool's not being used. So again, I think this, this uh, all goes to creativity. Um, Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, it, it is a time to be creative. As Lincoln was just saying, I, you know, if you've got a pool that is going to need to be plastered next year, um, why not go ahead and get it done this year while it's closed anyway? Um, so it's about you making some recommendations. And if you're in a financial position to be able to carry some of those costs um, for a period of time, that might be helpful, it might be enough incentive. Um, perhaps if business is down a bit, you're willing to do some work uh, at a lower lower price, lower cost. Um, it's another um, another way to put that forward with uh, prospective clients and current clients about um, maybe getting them to do something they wouldn't normally do at this point in time. Uh, it's about finding some incentives for them. Anything to add so, to? Yeah, I, I think that that question kind of bled into the answers kind of bled into number 10 which is how can I handle community clients who are deferring non-essential work um, which is what I think I'll address and then and then open up to you guys but how do I handle community clients who are deferring non-essential work I would find out from the association I think first one of two things what's the reason for the deferral of the work are you are they deferring the work because they're concerned about having um, people in their building that are not the actual owners of the property um, and the risk of contagion, or is it a financial matter? Because you can react and treat both of those completely differently. So if um, a business partner comes up against the first where it's simply a matter of the concern over the contagion, then you can try to work with management and define um, safeguards that can be done or work of the scope that you have, maybe you can't do all of it, but there's, there are certain things that you can do that may be external to the property um, or are things that uh, with, the safe, with certain safety protocols in place that they'd be willing to allow you to um, come into the building and do the things you need to do so that you can keep your contract running and you can keep your schedule going. Um, where it's a financial matter, there i think you would have to then make the decision as a business partner and as a company on your own can you afford to do the work now bill them and give them a deferment of whether it's 30 60 90 days uh, to make payments or come up with a payment plan that might be more amenable to them being able to do it whereas they get the work accomplished um, your payment is going to be there it'll just come in in a longer period of time but it saves you the risk of possibly the association canceling the work altogether or maybe changing their mind the board changes something else happens down the risk so kind of a bird in the hand uh methodology that you just get the work done now and worry about collection try to agree to something up front john yeah i, I absolutely agree with that i think that uh, it's a great time to be doing work outside as well um uh, i think some of the costs have, have come down I, everybody does want to work 
Um, another way to pitch it to, to clients, I would think, would be, um, you know what, we want to help the economy stay strong. Uh, we want to help the economy keep going. Um, and most of those major projects are something that people will have reserved for or done a special assessment for. So in a lot of cases, the funds are already available. Uh, or as I said earlier, if there's a project that was going to be done next year um, and they've already got the funds and the reserves for it, uh, this year might be a great year to do it. Maybe it'll cost them a little bit less money. Uh, maybe you can get them into uh, into your schedule uh, quicker. So I would say, yes, go ahead. A question um, related to the question about people going and work, doing the work is, uh, how can I handle community client who requires specific protocols for ensuring our employees are healthy, wearing masks, et cetera? So you have a community that says, you can come do the work, but you need to follow certain protocols. Um, there is a there are a wealth of resources out there. Um, CDC.gov has COVID-19, which talks about the appropriate protocols. They're updating those daily. If you're watching the news, you're probably aware that masks are now recommended for um, interactions. Um, I think if you've got if you can go to an objective source like that and say, here are the protocols that we're going to follow. We will follow all of the appropriate protocols. Um, CDC actually breaks it down to protocols depending upon how much community spread you're facing in your community and the nature of your community. Um, I know there are local organizations in a number of states also that are providing similar advice. So I think if you can find an objective way that the uh, service provider can pro uh, indicate to the association, these are the protocols we're following and they're reasonable. Um, that's, I think, how you deal with a protocol. If an association is requiring protocols above and beyond that, I think you, you're going to have to address whether or not they're reasonable or whether or not they can be addressed. Um, I, th I think that goes back, actually, uh, Lincoln, to what we were talking about earlier, that if you have a plan in place already uh, for the safety of your people when they're going out, take a look and talk to the, the board, the managers, and find out um, how closely those two things are two programs are associated with each other. You know, perhaps you can make some um, additional um, compensation um, to be able to uh, follow their protocol that they want. Perhaps your protocol is even stronger um, than theirs. Uh, you know, I think that those are things that, that go a long way to helping you uh, get some business right now. In the absence of ridiculously undue expense, I don't think we can be too careful in being safe in these circumstances and providing the highest possible protocols that's reasonable. Agreed. We kind of went over uh, a couple of questions. So I think that uh, um, Lincoln or Vishnu, if you think any different, um, the last one we had was an association receive construction projects. I think we've pretty well covered that. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Thank you, Go gentlemen, on. very much. We're going to move to the live Q&A portion of today's webinar. So I have received already some questions that have been submitted and people have started raising their hands. Um, I'm going to go through the questions that have been submitted first, though if you haven't submitted questions and you would like to, please feel free to do that because we'll continue to look through these um, over the next 30 or so minutes and um, and and answer these questions and then we will also allow people go to people who have their hands raised. Um, okay, so this one doesn't look so much as a question but a statement and I will make the statement and then see if John, Lincoln, Vishnu, you have anything to add. In the case of pool service, it is required to do at least a basic level of service to prevent the pool from becoming a health hazard. So community association boards need to know that it's not okay to let their pools turn green because this unmaintained water um, could breed pathogens and other issues um, that could be very difficult for, uh, that could bring in um, mosquitoes and could also then be difficult for the community association to get a handle on, could be an expensive problem down the road. Gentlemen, do you have anything to add to that comment? Sure. Um, I, I think that that's an excellent point. I think it goes back to looking for things. Uh, we talked about health and safety issues earlier. Those things still need to be done. So it's perhaps looking at things in a different way than we've looked at them in the past. Um, and I believe that uh, that's right up that alley. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Um, what about 
entry to individual units to address things like a plumbing need. So how can a business partner who obviously is a plumber or maybe an electrician, um, how can they work with the, what do they need to do to prepare to um, work with the condominium board and management on those types of circumstances? Well, again, I think the, the very first thing is for them to have their own protocol in place on how they're going to handle it. I think that uh, it works out really well right now, especially if you can schedule an appointment so that the owners are not inside the unit um, and that you'll tell them what precautions you're going to take as you leave for cleaning the unit. Most of the restoration companies um, around already have protocols in place for um, doing a cleaning that, that uh, um, is hopefully sufficient to uh, take care of the, the virus. Um, so just making sure that you have all those things in place and it's really just thinking it all the way through, but not having people in the, in the unit, I think is a really good way to do it. Schedule it when they're gone. Vishnu, Lincoln, anything to add? Uh, Vishnu, I think it's um, super important that you just do the basics. If you're going into another person's property you, you, and, and consider the minute you enter that building, somebody else's property, you know, the minimum they should all walk in with is gloves. They should walk in with a mask. And um, most of the contractors I know, for example, like here, the cable contractors and electricians will have those booties that you put on uh, when they're walking in. I mean, all things that are disposable that you walk in, you put on, uh, it protects you, it protects the association, and it gives them that comfort level that you're taking this seriously. And I love John's idea um, about making sure that the owners are not in the unit at the time the trade um, is in there. I think you could also encourage the owners to be mindful of the, the risks and concerns the service providers may have. The owners may want to uh, make assurances that they've cleaned the doorknobs and the light switches that are going to need to be accessed and that the place has been cleaned before the service provider comes in because it's a two-way street as far as protecting one another. It's an excellent point. This is back to some of the federal stimulus funding. Um, there's a question about whether law firms should consider filing for um, the idle loans, the economic injury disaster loans, or do they need to wait to uh, demonstrate uh, economic injury before um, submitting those loan applications? I believe our perspective um, from CAI's front is community associations are eligible also to um, apply for those loans and any small business I think is eligible to apply for those loans. However, the name of the loan indicates that you need to have economic injury um, and you need to demonstrate that when applying for those loans. Uh, Vishnu, Lincoln, John, any additional insight? Well, no. I, I, I certainly foresee some economic injury. I don't know at this point in time how much economic injury I mean, being in the uh, legal business, it may be, um, depending upon the nature of things, that the nature of the work I'm doing may shift and it may or may not. But um, I, I do anticipate that my workload is going to be reduced somewhat. I don't know how much. Um, and um, in, in that regard, I think that the, the money is there for a purpose. And I think it's appropriate to make the application and assuming you have a good faith expectation. If you don't, if you don't end up needing the funds, you can, or if you don't substantiate the need for the prepayment loans, you wouldn't be eligible. You'd be repaying a loan anyway. Yeah, Don, one of the things I, I think that this actually um, goes to an old saying, you don't get what you don't ask for. So maybe it's a good idea to go ahead and ask. The worst thing they can do is say no. I did also hear on a um, conversation I participated in recently relative to the EIDL loans, the EI economic injury disaster loans, um, is some banks may be offering loans with even more competitive interest rates than those economic injury disaster loans. So um, be sure to shop around as well. Yeah, John, if I could, um, that's a great point. And it's super important for associations to understand, for business partners to understand the differences between the programs that are being offered out there and they need to make sure they're getting the proper advice from their CPA and or their banker as to what programs are available for them and they're applying for the correct program and or the most appropriate one. 
And just because it may not be the right program with you today, doesn't mean three or four weeks from now, it may not be something that's applicable. So the PPP, the Payroll Protection Program, is a very specific program related to the opportunity to cover payroll costs and uh, is or is not reimbursable depending on a number of things as a grant. But if you can get it, as John said, and you can apply for it and it applies to you, great. Whether or not it becomes a grant for you or not in eight weeks, it's a 1% loan that is forbore, that, that they forbear six months and then repayable over two years. So if nothing more, it gives you a, a, a sense of comfort for cash flow for this time period because we don't know if this is wrapping up April 2nd, if it's wrapping up June 7th, if it's wrapping up when. So you need that cash flow and that cash flow of that program works for you is great. The economic damage, you may not have economic damage at this point, but there again, as Lincoln was kind of mentioning, you know, let's see where that stands in a month from now or two months from now that that program may be something that may be applicable for you. So keep up on this. Keep talking to your bankers. Keep talking to your CPAs. Make sure that you're in the know, at least generally, of what's out there for you so that when the time comes to it, you can trigger what may be necessary. Thanks. That's really helpful information, Vishnu. Appreciate that. Um, we also, CPI has been keeping uh, information on our website up to date with links directly to the Small Business Administration um, and very specific specific information on how um, CAI members may benefit from some of these programs. So please continue to visit our website as well. I'm going to switch over to Essential Worker. So there's a question here, has there been any, anything established, has there been any established guideline as to what defines an essential worker and what what type of services generally used by a homeowners association could be defined as essential? I'm going to answer the first part of that with because uh, we have a lot of information about the stay at home orders on our web page. We have every single state's stay at home order. We've also looked at the essential worker piece in each of those stay at home orders. And what we've seen is, I would say, uh, about two thirds or more two-thirds to three-quarters of the states use the Department of Homeland Security language to as their um, essential worker list. And in that language, um, we've found that it almost always includes homeowner association managers. Um, and then there are also the additional, um, we've seen pool management companies, plumbers, of course, electricians, of course, construction, um, residential construction, et cetera. So I think uh, if you go to our webpage, you'll find some information on that. But um, I think a lot of the, I'm not sure about landscapers. That's the one I haven't really looked for. Um, but a lot of our business partners would likely be qualified under that essential worker. Um, Lincoln, John, Vishnu, do you have additional insight in your state? Yeah, again, I want to reiterate that it's really um, varies from state to state. So it's really critical that you look at your own state, find out what yours are. In Colorado, uh, the landscapers are okay to be out working. Um, I think that typically they just, we just put common sense to it. If, if you can keep more than six feet apart uh, from each other, it might require a few more vehicles um, to transport the people back and forth to the job sites. Um, but if you take that seriously and um, take the appropriate precautions, you can. We've also found that in the high rises that we manage that everything from the pools, the indoor pools, um, even the exterior pools, if they're if they were open, uh, building engineers, uh, concierge staff, porters. What we've had to do is just uh, stagger that staff so that uh, we don't have too many people in in the building in close proximity at any given time. Utah is rather unique because we do not have a statewide stay-at-home order. We have uh, county by county uh, for the counties along the Wasatch Front, and it's a great example of how unique it is because. Uh, Salt Lake County, for example, defines essential services different than Summit County right next door. So depending upon the county you're in, you could have a different uh, definition as to what essential services are. That having been said, because it's directive, not an order, um, I think most people are using common sense. And if something reasonably needs to be done, they're getting it done and they're using appropriate social distancing and safety techniques to do so. Vishnu? Yeah, Florida is um, 
Yeah, Florida, Florida is a uh, Department of Homeland Security. However, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you really need to be conscious of not only what the state border is, uh, what the county and or your city that you're operating in. Uh, so for example, in South Florida, we have three counties we call the Tri-County area, which is West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami. There's 7 million people plus in these three counties. Uh, Broward County alone, which houses Fort Lauderdale, has 32 cities. Depending on the city that you go to, um, they have a different order maybe. So we have, as I mentioned earlier, you know, six or eight cities now that have uh, wear a mask order, where if you're out in public, you have to Vishnu, we kind of lost you. Kind of. Okay, sorry, am I back? Oh, you are back, but it's a little bit, um, the volume's a little low. Um, Take off okay. your mask. Is that any better? <laughs> yeah. Uh, slightly better? <laughs> there you go. Okay, okay, great. Um, solar flare. Um, so uh, all, all I was gonna say is just make sure that you're checking with the city and the county. Um, you can't rely only on the state because in our state, for example, as I mentioned earlier, Florida sets the minimum standard. Um, the counties and the cities are upping those standards every single day. Um, so make sure that the city you're operating in, you understand what their rules are because you don't want to get cited for something in a particular city. Uh, in Miami Beach, for example, right now, the police will cite you if you do not have uh, a mask on. Excellent. Okay, there is... I'm hearing a little feedback. There's a question regarding um, architectural review requests. So there are, I guess there are some services out there that allow online submission and reviews of architectural requests. If a board determines not to use that online service or, or to stop reviewing architectural re review requests, um is that is there some sort of liability or exposure to the board um, i i guess I, I i'm not certain i understand the question because an architectural request would seem to be one of those circumstances where you could almost certainly find a way to do it without needing the interpersonal contact there's technology out there that would allow the review um I do think that if an association were to forego architectural um, reviews for a short period of time, there could be a contention that the provisions were waived. I think that would be a weak contention in light of the circumstances, but I think the association should be mindful of that. It does raise an interesting question about deferring architectural uh, reviews, however, because there are so many association uh, architectural guidelines out there that say, if the uh, matter is not reviewed or approved within 60 or 90 days, it's deemed mm -hmm. approved. So if you find yourself in a circumstance where you cannot do something in a timely fashion, make certain that you step up and specifically uh, note that it is being declined or being deferred so that you don't lose the, the ability to enforce it. Because I've, I've litigated those matters and I'm sure many of you, many of our participants have been involved on both sides of them, so. Don't let the time slip away. John? Yeah, uh, one of the things I was just thinking about, um, couldn't an association just adopt a policy that says, um, for the time being, we're gonna decline every single architectural control request and end up with the same um, result? They wouldn't have let it go so that they still meet those uh, statute timelines. Um, they get them dealt with. Um, they don't have to meet in person. And what they're saying is, hey guys, we're just not gonna deal with any of these right now, so we're gonna turn them all down and still be covered? I suppose that would uh, require an analysis of the particular documents and questions. So what, what I like to always say is contact your lawyer and talk to him or her. Um, I think that a, a general resolution to that effect or just something, um, you know, tickling the, tickling the timeframes on the applications and if if 45 days rolls around and you haven't had an opportunity to review something you got 60 days decline it and um you know start the process anew again this probably boils down to communication uh everybody should be a little bit willing to uh 
accommodate one another in light of unique circumstances. And one would hope that um, communications can result in the necessary deferrals, but do put it in writing. Excellent. Vishnu, anything to add? Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, by the way, we I just had a conversation with a group that will be speaking next week um, to community association managers about um, issues that they're facing. And the idea came up of maybe after this is over with, taking a look at the board's ability to um, enforce an emergency, uh, their own emergency action to be able to um, postpone some of these things, right? Either to vote by, um, you know, just look at what they learned in this pandemic and determine what emergency actions they may need in the future. Uh, God forbid we have to deal with something like this again. So uh, just a, a side note. Uh, there's a question here that I'm happy to answer, which is, will homeowners associations or condominiums be eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program? Right now they are not eligible and um, we have um, that information from the Small Business Administration saying it, associations, unless they are um, a 501c3, which is pretty rare, they are not eligible for the PPP loan. Um, any, of the, any of you who may be um, CAI advocates may have just received an email from me asking you to reach out to your member of Congress, urging them to include um, homeowners associations and condominiums in the next round of funding for the PPP loan program, um, please do that. But right now we don't, we do not um, interpret the regulations and the CARES Act to include community associations as eligible entities. I'm going to now, those are all the questions that we have um, so far, I'm going to go to people who have raised their hands. So Phoebe's going to help me here. She's going to open the mics. And the first person I'm going to go to is Kim Miles. Kim, your microphone will be open, so you can feel free to ask your question. Kim Miles. Kim, your microphone's open if you want to ask your question. Okay, Kim may have taken uh, a walk away from her home office. Um, I'm going to move it to our next, uh, the next individual who has their hand raised. Her name is Kimberly Norton. Kimberly Norton, we're opening your microphone so that you can ask your question. Kimberly, your phone is self-muted, so if you want to unmute your phone, you should be able to ask the question. Let's see. Oh, Kimberly. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next um, individual, Marshall Dickler. Marshall, do you have a question for the panel? Hi, everyone. Hi there. Uh, I just sent one, but I wanna make a comment about what you just said about associations. Uh, I have spent an enormous amount of time reviewing the PPE loan and actually making application for the firm and for one of their client. Uh, according to my reading of the application, associations are not-for-profit entities that can apply. They're, um, uh, they, they fit all of the parameters, I believe, of the loan. Uh, although they just changed it to not-for-profit 501c3s, and I don't know, originally it was all not-for-profits were included, and I, they're a corporation, it may be a not-for-profit under the local law, but they are a corporate entity. They typically have under 500, the problem, 500 employees. The problem with them is, in most cases, they have um, 1099, Payments. They don't have employees. If they actually have employees that are staff employees, it seems to me they would qualify for the PPP loan. I mean, people that are W-2 employees. 
And that is a big difference. So my first question is, why wouldn't they qualify like any other corporate entity if they have a pool employee, if they have on-site management people that they pay directly, not through a management company, that they pay directly and are part of them, their service. Uh, they have janitors typically, and the janitors are paid directly, particularly in high rise. And in most of the high rises, they have pretty significant staff people that perform all kinds of functions in the building that are hired people rather than outside contractors. So they would qualify under that program, just like any other entity that would be qualified under that program. Am I missing Thanks. something? Thanks, Marshall. Um, actually, the CARES Act under the PPP program, the Paychecks Protection Program loan, specifically says nonprofits that are 501c3, 501c19, which is a veteran service organization, or tribal organizations. And the subsequent um, regulations affirm only nonprofits that are 501c3. 501c19 and tribal organizations um so we we can take the um if you want to have the further conversation we can take this offline um because this has been really an issue of a lot of confusion um within the industry here um but we did talk with representation from the small business committee staff um, that drafted this language in the CARES Act and they affirmed that the only nonprofits eligible for the PPP are again 501c3, 501c19 and uh, tribal organizations. The community associations um, who are organized in their state as a nonprofit corporation are eligible for the economic injury disaster loans. That was my next question. Are they, there you also, go. Are they also eligible for the uh, $10,000 uh, uh, economic injury disaster loan grant? So potentially that grant piece has really been changing in the last um, 48 hours. Um, and it looks like that grant piece, that $10,000 might be a linked to payroll per employee. So $1,000 per employee. We're doing some additional, um, an, an additional dive into content related to that idle loan. That idle loan is a process that's been in place for a long time. So they just funded it through the CARES Act. Um, so I'm not sure that that's actually gonna turn into a grant. That's um, a little up in the air right now in our uh, reading of the of the statute and the the loan provisions. All right, well, the other one is, of course, the 7A grants, which are available, I believe, to associations at this point in time, one way or another, but it is 3.75% on the loan. Right, which you could find that loan maybe at a better price somewhere else. Um, thank you so much for your question, Marshall. Really appreciate it. Um, and as as I mentioned, we did send out a call to action on this issue so that we can hopefully expand the eligibility to community associations for the PPP program. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to our next um, question, Tim Forsyth. Tim, we're getting your microphone opened. Tim, your microphone's open if you have a question for us, for the panel. Tim, you might be self-muted. Do you wanna check to see if you're, you're muted? Okay, not hearing you, Tim. So we're gonna go on to our next um, question. And that question is Crystal Chang. Crystal, your microphone is being opened. Uh, yes, actually, I have the same question as Marshall, and he already asked, and uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for participating today. Does anyone else have any other questions um, that you want to submit or raise your hand for um, these, these fine gentlemen? If not, I'm going to give each of them an opportunity to um, make a few closing comments. Um, I'm going to start with Lincoln, then John, then Vishnu. So let me just look and make sure there are no other questions, gentlemen.
Okay, I'm going to open microphone for um, Gary Leibler or Labler. I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name properly. Um, Gary, we're opening your microphone. Thank you. My question is regarding the guidance that CAI provided on March 31st for payment plans and foreclosure forbearance at communities yes. and also for the waiver of late fees and so forth. The document refers to cases of hardship and the question would be uh, in what manner should hardships be determined or verified uh, especially while a lot of these employees at management companies are working remotely so any guidance on verifying hardship when in fact many uh, owners should have replacement forms of income and even potentially more income with unemployment through the federal subsidy and so forth great thank you for that question so um this question is referring to cai's um statement of moratorium on foreclosure actions um, related to people who living in community associations have um, a hardship in paying their community association assessments. Um, we put a statement out for community associations to voluntarily adopt that would stop any foreclosures until June 1st related specifically to um, COVID-19 hardships. Um, as far as what type of proof and how um, community associations would evaluate or what kind of documentation um, we would suggest community associations looking for, we would suggest that, that um, you work with your managers, you work with your attorneys um, to determine a um, fair and standard set of documents or set of information to receive from residents who are facing a hardship. Um, Lincoln, John, Vishnu, I'm going to turn it to you guys to see if you've had any conversations about this um, in your with you, within your communities on how to address this. I, I haven't had any conversations um, unique to this situation, but we went through this a uh, dozen or so years ago. And a lot of this, of course, is going to depend from community to community. If you've got a smaller community, it may be easier to ascertain who, in fact, has a hardship in a, in a very small community. But a larger community, I think, can and should adopt a resolution, an internal resolution, as to what uh, their expectations are for hardships. And we did this during the economic downturn in 2008, 2009 for some of our associations. And somebody can submit the fact that they have lost their job or they've lost their job and have lost the ability to obtain unemployment. And you can you can make that a process that can be can be managed and it can be objective and I think it can be uh, managed and objective. I don't think that the uh, expectation is that everybody will cease making their their payments. I would hope that people will make their payments if they can make their payments, but associations should be willing to communicate with their uh, owners in good faith and to the extent the association can i think it's an opportunity to enhance community by working with people to try and get get through these, through these difficult times we've touched on the difficulties to associations and of course there has to be a balance but um i think the best way to handle it is with a proper protocol depending on the size of the association and what the needs are and abilities are to verify thank you john do you have anything to add Sure, um, I absolutely agree. I, we've made the same recommendations um, when it comes to hardships. We've had a number of boards that have come to us and said that they wanted to suspend uh, payment or say that it's it's okay not to make your payment for a while. We've discouraged them from doing that um, and really made it uh, um, a suggestion to them that they use, um, allow people to submit something to them to, to uh, so that they can determine if there really is a hardship rather than just having a blanket that says, no, you're going to have to pay your assessments for a couple of months. Good point. Vishnu, anything to add? Yeah, um, I agree with both that, that you have to have the standard plan and that, and that you need to take it on a case-by-case -case, uh, and be careful of blanket um, forbearances. But the one thing that, that the caller mentioned, and I really want to caution everybody on this um, out there from the association side, is 
don't believe that just because there are these unemployment program benefits and all this legislation that's out there that this is happening. It isn't. Um, so what we're seeing real life down here uh, in Florida, and I know uh, 60 Minutes did a whole piece on New York, um, you can't get through to unemployment. Um, there are people who've been trying for three, four weeks to get through to unemployment and you cannot get through to even file. There was a mini riot in Miami uh, two days ago where they were just handing out the forms to be able to file for unemployment. Um, and it, it just became total chaos because you cannot get through. They're just so overwhelmed with the mass of, of ability. And then we had somebody that we personally know, somebody on staff, um, whose uh, spouse is unemployed from the um, hotel industry. And they finally, after three and a half weeks, got through to unemployment and were told that they were only going to qualify for the state of Florida minimum $275 a week, that the federal program, the state of Florida unemployment had no idea how they were going to implement that, how and when and if they were going to pay that out. So, but all that would be guaranteed right now is $275 a week, uh, which is what state of Florida offers. So, um, be, con be conscious of that when when associations are making I you know plans for how and what they think that somebody may or may not be getting if somebody's unemployed they're unemployed uh, unemployment is very very difficult right now to, to get excellent thank you all right we have two more questions I'm going to try to get to both of these and we'll have to answer them quickly um, the first one is Christian George Lee Christian we're going to open up your microphone you can go ahead and ask your question uh, I'm sorry, I accidentally hit the raise my hand function, so I'm sorry to bother you all. Oh, it's so good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. No problem at all. Okay, I'm going to move forward to uh, Beth Mulcahy. Beth? Beth, are you, uh, your microphone should be open. You might be self-muted. Beth, one more chance. Okay, gentlemen, I wanna thank you so much. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. We had about 180 people on the line today. So um, I want to thank everybody who joined us today for participating. These are challenging, uncertain times. Thank you for making the community association industry what it is and for helping your communities um, and helping our communities um, gentlemen, Lincoln, John, Vishnu, thank you so much for your expertise and participation. I'm going to let each of you say a few words to wrap things up and then we'll end the webinar. Lincoln? Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate and thanks to all of you who did uh, in fact participate. I hope you found this to be helpful. Um, these are unique times we're facing and I think that we as um, in, in this industry, particularly the industry leaders involved in CAI, can set forth a good example in helping people in their communities. I think it's a good opportunity to um, think creatively, think think in the context of community rather than self, and let's uh, work all together to get through this. John? Yeah, I wanted to say also thank you very much for uh, the opportunity and thank you all for taking part in it. Um, my best advice is that because we have what I'm calling a, a new normal for now. Um, it's not going to be forever. Uh, we don't know what it's going to look like in the future. Um, I think the first thing is we need to be creative as we address these new circumstances. These are things that we haven't faced before. Um, everyone out there has ideas. Uh, I think it's, it's important to bring those forward and, and be creative with them. Uh, secondly, we need to act quickly. Um, things are changing and moving at a pace that I don't think we've ever seen before in our lives. Um, so it's it's about being um, agile as we as we move forward. So act quickly. Um, thirdly, um, take the CDC's recommendations seriously. Um, this really is a big deal. We've seen some signs that there might be some slight improvement based on social distancing. We don't know how long that's going to keep up. Um, but take them seriously as you're out and about. Take them seriously as you're interacting with um, owners and also for your employees as well. And lastly, I'll stay safe. Thank you. Vishnu? Uh, thanks, Don. Um, appreciate the opportunity this afternoon. Two things I'd like to leave everybody with. Um, one, um, keep up on everything that's coming out. Be self-serving in that regard as a business partner. 
um, you've got a business to operate, you've got staff to take care of, as you well know, keep up on every program that's out there, whether it's a grant program, a loan program, um, make sure you know what's going on, keep up on the updates, because if it doesn't apply to you today, it may apply to you tomorrow. And you wanna make sure that you're getting in as soon as you possibly can on every program that comes out. Uh, the other thing I would just say that along the lines of being creative, um, what we're seeing a lot of down here is giving back. So we have any number of business partners that may have a lull, may not have as much activity, and they're finding creative ways to give back to their community, to give back to their association. It's a great way to build um, a name for yourself. It's a great way to build rapport with the associations and or the community in general so that your name gets out there. So keep that in mind. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Gentlemen, I'm going to end our webinar. Thanks again. And um, I'll steal what John said, which is um, stay healthy and stay safe, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen.